All right, welcome back to Computer Science E76. This is our second lecture on iOS. So tonight we'll continue our conversation about Objective C and then dive headfirst into some actual iPhone and iPad like development. But first, a few fun facts from the survey that everyone filled out earlier in the semester. Recall that we asked you、uh, what do you do for a living? Where do you work?、Uh, what platforms do you use? What mobile devices do you use? And just to give you a sense of who you are,、um, this is a visualization of the most frequently occurring words in people's job descriptions.、So So, we have quite a number of software related folks engineer, web, senior, developer. And then, if you read in some of the smaller print, you'll see some other、uh, text as well. But this is、uh, available online if you'd like to zoom in and look at it in higher fidelity, but perhaps no surprises there. A lot of you are from Harvard.、Um, when asked to describe your places of employment, a lot of you from、uh, university and school and Berkman Center and business, and then throughout there are a whole number. Of other companies realized that the opt in rate was just over 50%. So there's actually twice as many folks with different titles and job descriptions here. This just depicts those who opted in to the sharing of information.、Uh, you'll see on the、um, Uh, help uh, uh, on the、uh, help site, help.cs76.net,、um, that we encourage, or actually, my email this morning encourages you to just reach out to us at the help address if you'd like to meet any of your classmates that you see described on the Google document that we shared this morning. As for OSs used regularly, Mac OS has a slight lead here in terms of versions, but if you add up all of the Windows users, this is kind of funny, it does seem to be consistent with、uh, trends in the real world.、Um, but a lot of you are still using XP, about the same using 7, and some of you. Are indeed on、uh, Vista.、Uh, in terms of the devices that you all use, definitely a lot of iPhones and iPads and iPod touches in the iOS space,、uh, but a non trivial number of iPhones, a couple of Android tablets.、Um, granted, it was a little soon, zero Windows 7 phones, but recall that that just shipped a few months ago now,、um, but zero WebOS phones as well. So, just to give you a sense of who you are,、um, we actually have a nice smattering from all the various platforms that at least we're focusing on in this particular course. And your Most excited for、um, Android 39%, web 12%, and iOS just ekes out、uh, this semester 48%. So, without further ado, some more on iOS. So, recall that last week, We dove into Objective C, which syntactically is a bit messier than languages with which you might be familiar. It's at least a little bit different.、Um, but recall that we introduced this notion of a header file, a .h file. This is、uh, carried over from the language C. In header files, do you place your class declarations, what they look like, what instance variables go inside them? You might put other、uh, import or include statements so as to include、uh, other header files within your own projects.、Uh, on the .m files, though, is where you actually implement your Or methods and actually synthesize, very,、uh, synthesize properties, we'll discuss today. So, those are really the two primary files. And you'll see starting tonight and with the、uh, upcoming projects that you'll,、uh, when using Xcode in particular, you'll get a non trivial number of files automatically generated for you. But typically, they will end with these extensions, though there's a couple of others that we saw last week, including quick trivia a、uh, .pch file. Anyone recall what that was? Yeah, pre compiled header. So you'll usually get one of those for free when you use one of the Xcode templates. And it's super short. It's essentially a header file, like a .h file, but it contains lines of code that essentially get prepended to all of your files so that you can have essentially some global import statements on all of your files. But you'll get one of those for free. But for the most part, we'll start focusing on these .h, .m, and soon .nib, xib files. So we talked about instance variables. We've seen these in Java. You've seen these perhaps in other languages. By default, when you declare an instance variable, As we'll see recurringly,、uh, it gets a status of protected. But there is the notion of private and public, but we won't dwell on that so much just yet until we dive into an example in a moment.、Uh, class methods. Any method, recall, that starts with a plus sign is a class or static method. That means you can call that method on a class without doing what? Without actually instantiating an object thereof. So, alloc, which is sort of the analog to the new operator in some languages, is how you allocate space for an object of a particular class. Meanwhile, you have、uh, instance methods, those that start with hyphens to distinguish them from the plus signs. And here are, here are some examples we'll see in just a bit, whereby this first one here is an instance method, which means you can only call this method if you've already instantiated an object. The context here, as we'll see in a moment, is a student object. And I decide Arbitrarily, a student will have a name and an age, but that's it for now. So, this means that any student object has a getter, it seems, an accessor method called age that returns an int. It also has a setter called setAge that ret 
returns void but takes an int as its argument. And then it appears to have an initialization method, two of them, in fact, one just called init, which typically is the default by convention, another of which is called init with name. And age. And recall, this was perhaps the first syntactic curiosity we saw with Objective C, in that you kind of have these named parameters, but the order does matter. And the general guidance in choosing names for your methods is that typically, stylistically, they tend to read almost like a sentence, where you might literally say, call init with name and age. It just so happens that when you pass Uh, a message of this form to an object, as we'll soon do ourselves. You parameterize it here inside of the name, if you will, and then also here, as implied by the colons. But we'll start to see this hands on very soon. But at this point in the story, really, there's no new features of the language, nothing that you couldn't do via some other syntax in Java.、Um, but really, now we're just acclimating to the syntax. Now, the syntax that's also most striking, besides、um, the pluses and minuses we just saw, are how you invoke methods.、So You don't call a method in Objective C. Rather, you pass a message to an object that then responds to that message by calling a method, essentially. But semantically, folks, generally,、uh, it is correct to say passing messages. So in this top line here, I have somehow, presumably, instantiated a student object and called it student in all lowercase. And then I'm just calling age. Now, in this context, that's a useless. Uh, method call. It's a, a useless message to pass because I'm not actually doing anything with the return value. But that's how I would call the getter. This is how I would call the setter. And then if I wanted to call the initialization method or the more explicit initialization method, I can pass in two parameters in this way. And again, just as a teaser, and we'll start writing real code、uh, shortly, the at sign denotes what? Because that was a new piece of syntax, perhaps. Yeah, and a string. So that means that, quote unquote, Alice is not a string in the C style of、uh, an array of characters, chars, but rather it's an actual object of type ns string, which means there are methods associated with it, and it is, in fact, distinct from a C based string. So,、um, just so we have the, the jargon there,、um, these names of these methods, you would generally refer to them as selectors. And this will be useful jargon to have because we'll actually see some interesting syntax before long whereby you can pass one method the name of another. And that name is generally referred to as a selector. But more on that when we actually need to do that. So let's actually dive into an example. So I'm going to go ahead and load up Xcode. Some of the examples tonight I'll start to do on the fly. Some of them I'll grab some prefabbed code from、uh, last week's and this week's zip file online just for speed's sake. But recall that last week we actually didn't write until the very end of class a single iOS application. We did all Macintosh based applications because we just wanted a little sandbox in which to write some command line utilities to just play with syntax. So let's do Just a couple more of those here, but to use them as an opportunity to discuss some of the actual features of Objective C that we can then use and deploy in an iOS context. So, to be clear, I started out with this window here. Choose a new template for your project. I wanted a super simple template, so I chose Mac OS X application, command line tool. And the upside of this for now is that it gives me as few pieces of、uh, code. Uh, as possible, I can focus on writing almost everything myself. It's asking me for my product name. I'm going to call this the Student One Project.、Uh, the type here is Foundation, which implies using Objective C, but also gives me some import statements by default. So I'm going to click Next there. I'm going to go ahead and save the files on my desktop or whatnot. And recall that this was one of the first screens we saw last week. So, more detail than we care about right now.、Um, in fact,、um, even though the font is small, I'll zoom in as needed here. But at the top left are all of our files. And you'll see that under that list of files, we had one interesting one for now. So at the top left here, we have these、uh, main.m, student1.1, some supporting files. There's that PCH file, and then mention of these frameworks and products. So we're going to focus for now on just main.m. And in main.m, I have the opportunity now to start writing a program. So what might we want this program to do? Well, very simply, I'm going to go ahead and whip up. The following. Actually, let me go ahead and、uh, open this for time's sake. Go into our student one example. And let's take a look at this main.m. So, in this main.m, notice it starts off fairly C like. We've got some import statements at the top. Import is, being, is almost identical in spirit to include, but it avoids some、uh, cycles potentially, multiple inclusions. Then I have a prototype. What's the purpose of a prototype in C or Objective C? Prototype 
Uh, this is the function signature, but why bother if I'm clearly not implementing it yet at this point in the story? Yeah? So you can use it before you define its body. Exactly. So I can actually call it in code that chronologically comes before anything else in my file. So it's a hint to the compiler that expect me to implement at some point a function called greet. It's going to take a pointer to a student as its argument, but I don't have time to implement it just yet for you. It's somewhere else. So what, pro what might this program do? Well, we're calling C as well as in our Objective-C environment, the default function that gets called that we've gotten a bit of template code for almost always is called main. Main can take some command line arguments, but we're not going to use them for now um, or really ever for our purposes. And we saw this line of code here. And we waved our hands at it last week, but we'll talk a bit more about memory management today, but know that in Objective-C, you do have to allocate menu, mem memory quite often. And the method we've discussed thus far is called alloc. Well, when you alloc memory, you're responsible ultimately for releasing that same memory. But not always, because you can imagine scenarios where it'd be pretty useful to call a method that itself returns a chunk of memory that it allocated for you. But now that begs the question, then who deallocates it? That function, do you have to call that function again to actually deallocate the memory? Do you do it? Well, in that sticky situation, what that method would have done is instead uh, specify that this chunk of memory it allocated will be auto-released. And that's sort of a flag to the runtime that says, make sure to release this memory eventually without the user, the caller, having to manually call uh, the equivalent of release. But more on that in a moment. But that's what this line of code is referring to here. It's telling the computer, I need a chunk of memory just in case I call or I write methods that need to uh, allocate memory that's going to be auto-released. Um, it's not quite garbage collected. We'll come back to that. So you need this pool of memory. If we fast forward to the bottom of this program, at the end of main, what you'll see is that that pool is eventually, quote unquote, drained, which means that anything you've put into that pool uh, will be freed up for you. So it's a useful thing and necessary, and you can actually allocate more than just one pool, uh, but we'll leave that for another day. So what's this program going to do? Well, let's just look at some syntax, and you, hopefully it'll become more and more readable fairly quickly. So here is going to be a student object called Alice. So Alice is the name of my variable. The type of that variable is a pointer to a student. So that's hopefully familiar syntax from last week. On the right-hand side in English, what is this expression doing for me? Yeah, it's allocating a chunk of memory uh, big enough to hold a student object. More specifically, I'm passing the student class a message, specifically the name of a, um, uh, a class method whose purpose in life, again, is to allocate memory and then return a pointer there too. So at this point in the story, inside of Alice is essentially the address of that chunk of memory in RAM that I can now treat as a student object. Well, here's how I'm going to use my syntax. I'm actually going to use some C style or C++ style in syntax here and say Alice arrow age and Alice arrow name is going to get 20 and Alice respectively. So what's going on here? Well, these seem to be instance variables. And let me confirm this, uh, this suspicion. If I open up student.h, which is where I've declared this class called student, sure enough, there's not all that much to it. So the stuff at the top is comments. This is an import line that says, give me access to all of Apple's libraries. The next few lines are the class definition. So recall that last week we said that what Java calls a class, Objective-C calls an interface. So at interface means here comes my class declaration. It inherits from this sort of grandfather of objects called NS objects, though you can inherit from other objects, but this is the most common. Here I have a sort of C++ style at public specifier that says everything I write on the lines that follow should be public, which means any class, any method can access these properties by way of that arrow notation. Not the best approach, but this is example one, wanted to keep it simple is all. We'll introduce getters and setters in a moment. Now, what are the instance variables that every student will have? One well, age, which I'm going to sort of, you know, sort of uh, lazily just say is an int, but that would lead me to negative options, but I'll deal with that later. Um, and then an ns string star for name, you would never just write ns string name. You'll always prefix it with the star to denote a pointer there too. And we'll see um, why it is that we're passing addresses around all the time. Close angle, uh, close curly brace. Uh, at end, normally I could put class methods here, but I don't have any yet, so that's it. 
So, really, my class called student at this point in the story is just a glorified C struct because I've not associated any methods with the student. I'm just wrapping these two pieces of data an age and a name. So, if I go back now to main.m, hopefully this is clear. Whereas Java would use a dot notation, C, C, Objective C would use arrow notation here, but this means the Alice object's age instance variable gets 20, and then the name is set、uh, accordingly as well. So, greet, there's that function I promised I'd implement called greet. I'm passing Alice by pointer to that function. For now, let's assume that that just greets Alice and says, Hi, Alice, how are you? or something like that. This line of code, though, here is important, and it's a crit critical habit to get into. You must call release if you yourself have allocated memory by calling, in this case, the alloc method. But there's a few others we'll see, including new. Uh, and copy, and a couple of other ones as well. But alloc for now is certainly going to be the most common. So, mental note, written note, anytime you call alloc, you must call release. And the disclaimer there is unless you do auto release, but we'll come back to that. So, it's very much like、uh, malloc in free, or new and delete, or any non garbage collected language where you need to have. Both、uh, calls in there explicitly. Bob's code, almost identical. I'm allocating a second object for him, storing in Bob. Age is going to be slightly different. Name is slightly different. Greet him, release him, drain the pool, and that's it. Now, what is the greet method defined as looking like? Well, let's scroll down to the bottom here. At the bottom here, we have the function greet, returns void because it doesn't need to return anything, called greet. Takes a pointer to a student here, and all I'm doing is using sort of our of new equivalent of printf. I, if I just want some command line、uh, debugging output, nslog, which takes an ns string as its argument, and it's going to say, hello, placeholder. This is the placeholder for an ns string. I see that you are a、uh, number placeholder, years old. Backslash n. Now, how do I plug in those、uh, placeholders' values? Well, using the same syntax as with, with which I set them s arrow name, s arrow age, done. So, the end result of this program, once I actually run it, which I can do by clicking the run button in Xcode's top left corner or by hitting Command R, is it will run at the bottom of my screen. I'll get my little debugger window. And if we zoom in here, it says in bold, Hello, Alice, I see that you are 20 years old. Hello, Bob, I see that you are. 21 years old. All right, a whirlwind tour through a relatively simple example that has very few features, but any questions? Yeah?、Uh, did you mention before,、uh, I'm sorry if you did,、uh, is there a dot notation equivalent to the arrow notation that you're using in there? Is there a dot notation equivalent to the arrow notation? Yes, I would not get into this habit, at least with Objective C, since you'll almost never use this notation anyway, at least with the foundation classes. But yes, Bob arrow age. Is actually syntactically equivalent to star bob dot age gets 21. And this, you can infer this if by a few leaps from last week, whereby star bob says go there, the dot notation means access the property, or rather the、uh, instance variable that's right there. The arrow operator, by contrast, does both of those in one breath for you. So correct, but more readable, I would say, is generally the arrow. Other, yeah. Uh, not necessarily, though we did specify that we want these constant strings. In this case, probably the compiler would be smart enough to just allocate those statically、um, since they're、uh, immutable. But, in, but、uh, as a matter of good practice, it should always be included nonetheless, because you don't necessarily know what's going on underneath the hood in any functions you yourself are calling. So it is necessary as a top level、uh, function call. Good question. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, good question.、Uh, I don't think it will work at all. The syntax, weird though it is,、um, is to say at public and then everything that follows on the subsequent lines will be public. If you want to change modes down here, you would just say at private or at protected. So you can toggle back and forth, but you would not use curly braces. C is a little different in that you'd use a colon.、Um, and of course, Java, you would do it one per line.、Um, it's just the syntactic decision they made. And in fact, you'll rarely. At least, certainly for the examples we start doing now, you'll rarely need to bother doing that since protected usually suffices. But for now, I actually wanted to open up access to these instance variables just so I could get at the data without writing methods yet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Good question. So if you're the only person writing this program or you're doing it in a small team, why bother、um, jumping through the hoops of getters and setters as we're about to do it? Oh, but the, oh, well, so that was the opposite. So the alternative to doing this is actually making it public,、uh, private, or protected, but then providing a programmatic access to the data.、Um, generally, what you've proposed, sort of just making everything public because it's simple and because you're the only one writing the code, it's fine, but starts to break down quickly, especially if your projects grow in scope、um, and if you too want to change implementation details and you realize, you know what, I actually really implemented the name field poorly. I'm leaking memory or I'm not retaining copy. You're doing something wrong. I mean, these layers of abstraction that developers have built up are generally a good thing for reasons. But for small projects, I mean, even I would not bother writing getters and setters if it's just more time than I want to spend on it. But it's a design decision. It's not strictly necessary, technically. All right. So, What's bad about this? Well, I can respond to that、um, rhetorical question with、um, the former question. Well, we're not really protecting this data in any way. We're committing for eternity to calling these data members age and name. And what about name, though? I could imagine down the road actually re implementing name such that I tease apart first name, middle name, last name. But here's a very simple example where if I've hard coded in name everywhere, there's no chance of my actually changing that, improving it in the future as I could with a getter. If I've just hard coded in arrow name. So, long story short, if I actually want to start encapsulating my code a little more effectively with an eye to the future, let's take a look at students two、uh, in Xcode. So, students two, I actually made a couple of decisions here. So, notice what I've done in student.h. So, this is among our printouts, but you will notice tonight that I went back after last week and changed some of our implementations. So, do rely on the PDF that's online after you leave tonight, as well as at the zip file that's online. The printout from last week、um, is slightly out of date now. But here's the latest version of students two. This is student.h. So, I've decided I can do better than that lazy approach to implementing a class called student. I'm going to Actually, implement some getters and setters now. So, syntactically, how might I do this? Well, the top of the file is going to be identical for now, though I did make the design decision to prefix my instance variables with an underscore just so that later on it's more obvious to me, the dummy, what's an instance variable and what's like a local variable. Just a convention that I chose to go with here. But notice each is of int and ns string star. So the types have not changed. Notice I close my curly brace. This might be one of these first weird stylistic decisions, but The instance variables go inside the curly braces, the method declarations go outside, but still in between at interface and at end. So here come my method declarations. The minus sign means what? Instance method, which means you've got to instantiate a student object if you want to call any of these. If it were instead a plus, then you wouldn't have to. Now let's. Let's, let's point out the obvious. Absent at the already is that alloc method. How could I possibly ever allocate a student object if there's no mention of plus or alloc? It's an NS object. So, because this class descends from NS object, you get a whole bunch of methods for free some instance, some class methods, among them, those sort of fundamentals like alloc and init. Um, and a number of others. So, we don't have to override those if we don't want. We certainly inherit them for free. So, I do want to implement an, a setter and a getter for age. I'm going to, with、uh, some foresight in mind, declare my getter to be identically named to the instance variable without the underscore and set age. Notice the pattern. It's called age. So, I'm going to do lowercase set. Capital age. And that's just a habit I'm going to get into right now. As a setter, it doesn't need to return anything, but it does need to take something, namely an integer, and I'm going to call it age here. How about my name setter and getter? Well, I'm going to take the same approach, but notice it's an NS string star for the parameter and the return value for the setter and getter, respectively. So now, how do I actually use these things? Well, let's go to this version of main.m. In this version of main, Pretty much starts out identically to the one before, but now notice instead of using that arrow notation, I'm now using the methods I've just defined. So I have Alice declared at top there. I'm allocating a student object. Then I am calling Alice's setAge、uh, method by passing in this message setAge colon 20. So, this is how I call the setter. Notice there's no equal sign on the left, there's no assignment because it's just a setter whose return value is void. I do the same thing for Alice. Again, beware, a common newbie mistake would be to omit accidentally the at sign, but Xcode will generally yell at you in yellow or red text if you make an error like that. I then call greet Alice, release Alice, 
And then Bob is uninteresting at that point because it's mostly copy paste. So the only difference here is instead of presumptuously looking inside of this object and getting the age field and the name field, now I'm programmatically asking the object, give me your age, give me your name, which now means in the future I can change the implementation details of age and name, which we'll see in a moment is actually a good thing for reasons of memory management. And the caller, my main.m or any friend I gave this student class to, doesn't have to worry about the convention. Changing on him or her. So now let's look then at the implementation of these methods. So in student.m is where I've actually implemented these methods. So let's see the syntax here. At the top of the file, I'm importing student.h so that the compiler knows when I mention capital S T U D E N T what in the world I'm talking about. Well, it's the class we just looked at a moment ago. At the top here, I don't have at interface, I have at implementation. And I specify the name of the class I'm implementing. And then I proceed to implement my methods. So the minus sign again means here comes a instance method. I specify the return value and the name. This is copied and pasted from the .h file. The only thing I've done differently is instead of ending that line with a semicolon in the .h file, I'm now diving into curly braces. So, I can actually implement this thing. Now, the getter is pretty straightforward. What does it mean to get my age? Well, it means to get the value of the instance variable that's representing my age, which is underscore age. So, return underscore age is as simple as that. How about setting the age? It too is pretty simple. So, when I want to set someone's age, it takes an int, call it age. And here already, you see one of the values of slightly distinguishing instance variables from local variables or parameters. Because I've called these something different, I can now do a very clean one liner like this, where it's clear that input is getting set to the, the instance variable is taking on the value of. The input. You can't do, for instance, this dot as you could in Java to achieve that in a setter here. So, this is pretty straightforward, even if the syntax is new. But what's interesting about a name is that it's actually an object. And anytime you deal with objects, it feels like it gets a little more complex. You might have to deal with memory management. And sure enough, let's see what's going on here. My getter for the name class, for the name uh, uh, getter, is just going to do the obvious. But setting's a little interesting because we alluded earlier to this idea that when you allocate memory, you eventually have to release it. But in Objective C, you kind of have to signify to the rest of the world if you, some other method altogether, wants to also hang on to that, that string or that object. If you want your own copy of it, do you just want a pointer to the original? In short, methods kind of have to communicate between one another through the runtime, through the language. And so we can do this by saying, I want to retain this object. Or I want to copy this object. And what you'll see is that Objective C, at least on the iPhone,、uh, plat on the iOS platform, it doesn't do garbage collection for you like Java. It doesn't kind of infer from your code when it's safe to actually take back memory that you asked for previously by calling new. Rather, Objective C implements something called reference counting, whereby when you call alloc, you are indeed given a chunk of memory. And that chunk of memory's so called reference count is by default one. Which means one person, one method, one entity in your program cares about that chunk of memory. So, what does release do? Well, just intuitively, if you were implementing release, how would you implement release? Exactly.、Uh, decrement a chunk of memory's reference count. So, it would go in this case from one to zero. At that point, the device is allowed to take back that memory. Reference counting means that so long as you have a non zero reference count, it's not going to get reclaimed, and, and except in dire circumstances whereby the user is just running way too many phone,、uh, applications and they just have to kill your program. But the memory will only be reclaimed by the operating system once the reference count is zero. So this means if you're implementing a method like a setter, and a setter by definition has to set a value equal to something else, if you want to set a value that happens to be a pointer, you kind of have to. Tell the operating system, I want to hang on to this chunk of memory in addition to anyone else who wants to hang on to this chunk of memory. So, the keyword with which you do that is a keyword called retain. Now, we're not going to use that in just a moment, but there's going to be an alternative. But retain would take a reference count of one to two. Which means even if the original guy who allocated the chunk of memory, the student object in question, says, release, I no longer care about this object, it will get decremented, the reference count to one. But that's OK because now this other guy who's hanging on to that chunk of memory is not going to have it pulled out from under him just because it's effectively released outside of his context. So, the downside of this
wonderfully symmetric approach of retaining and releasing memory is that the burden really is on you, the programmer, to get the addition and the subtraction right. Otherwise, memory leaks incur. And we'll look probably next week at how you can, with various tools, chase down memory leaks. But for now, probably the best habit to get into is any time you write a line of code that uses alloc, Five seconds later, make sure you do the corresponding release, or we'll see auto release call, and then fill in the code in between. So you get into that habit now. So let's see how we might implement set name. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let me cheat for just a moment. And I'm just going to do this with set name. So in my set name method, I am just going to do the same thing as before name gets name. Now, what this looks identical now to how we implemented age. But what's the problem here? Well, we talked last week about pointers, and indeed, name is a pointer to a string. So if I just very naively say underscore name gets name, I'm literally copying the pointer, the address, inside of name and storing it inside of underscore name. And so now this student object, Alice, if you will, is hanging on to that same pointer address. But according to the story I just told earlier, at that point in the story, the so-called retain count for that string is just by default 1, which means if after this setter returns, and this setter is going to return in an instant because it's so short, after this setter returns, suppose that main, the main function, decides, eh, I don't really care about this string anymore because I gave it to Alice. Alice had better, better have hung on to her name. Well, Alice didn't really hang on to her name here. All she did is duplicate that pointer. So if main then allows that memory to get reclaimed by the operating system, at this point in the story, Alice is going to be clinging to a pointer that's just no longer valid. It's pointing to a chunk of memory in RAM, but that no longer belongs to anyone because the operating system took it back. So intuitively, what we really want to do here is somehow retain the object stored in this name variable, retain the string. So we bump up its reference count by 1 so that it doesn't matter what happens outside the context of Alice. She has put her stake in the ground and said, I want to at least retain this object even if no one else cares about it anymore. So it turns out that we need to be a little more clever than that. So one way we could do this is as follows. We can say name retain. Literally as simple as that. And now I'm going to go ahead and retain that pointer. So I bump up the reference count, and then I assign the value here. But strings are kind of an interesting corner case, but a common corner case, in that, as we'll see before long, there are NS strings in the world. But there's also this subclass called NS mutable string. Mutable meaning you can change it. So the problem that we would at some point in our lives encounter if we just retain strings in this way is that if I actually handed Alice a mutable string, an NS mutable string object, and then I, being main, change that string, I could change Alice's name on her without ever actually calling her setter which if nothing else is semantically a bad thing, and it's probably incorrect. So really, if Alice wants to ensure that the object she's been handed, the string she's been handed, can be touched thereafter by no one other than her, well, she can't just retain the original object. She should really copy that object. And so the second rule of thumb with regard to memory management is going to be any time you alloc or copy an object, you must later release it somehow. So we have to make a mental note that in Alice's um, destructor, to borrow the jargon from C++, we have to remember at some point in the story to release the memory if we're about to retain or copy it. And that method is going to be called in Objective C the dealloc method, which Java does not have an analog of, but C++ does. So I'm going to go ahead and paste back my original code, which is correct. There's this other corner case that we won't dwell on for now. But funky things can happen if, by accident or intentionally, I pass to Alice the same name that she's already hanging on to, literally the same object. So you can end up actually uh, retaining or releasing um, an incorrect number of times. And so we actually want to hedge against this and check, you know what? If my name already equals the name you're going to give me, forget it. I'm not doing anything because I got it right the first time. I'm not going to screw things up. But rather, if they do not equal the same thing, because this is nil, the equivalent of 0 or null, and therefore I'm getting a new name, or if it's just my name's being changed from Alice to something else altogether, OK. Then I'm going to release the name I was hanging on to, whatever my original name was. Then I'm going to copy into this instance variable the name I've been given. So now, at this point in the story, the who knows what the reference count of this original name is. But because we've made a copy of it, now the new copy's reference count is 1, which just means mental note, Alice eventually has got to free up this memory. Yeah? 
Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, but uh, playful answer, I don't know what you're talking about yet, because that's example three. So yes, we will actually ameliorate some of this headache and the tediousness of implementing this for many, many different instance variables through precisely the mechanisms that you alluded to. So more on synthesize and properties in just a moment. So I said a moment ago, as soon as you call copy or alloc, you better within seconds actually uh, free that memory or release it. So you know what, sure enough, I'm going to go ahead and preemptively implement in my student.m file a dalloc method, whose return type is by definition void, where I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to free uh, the underscore name uh, instance variable by calling release, which means the reference count that was a moment ago one is now zero, which means the operating system is free to take my name away. I don't care about it anymore. And then for good measure, and as a matter of best practice, I'm also going to call my superclasses dalloc method, just in case he or she has to do some uh, housekeeping as well. Now in this case, NSObject's not going to really clean anything up, but certainly a good habit to get into and make uh, another mental written note. This is the only situation in which you, the programmer, should ever call dalloc. You should never call dalloc unless it is inside of one of your own dalloc methods. Otherwise, you should be using release or, as we'll eventually see, auto release. So, in short, don't ever call dalloc, except in this one case here. Uh, yeah, question. Wonderful question. What happens if uh, name, underscore name, is never set? Well, the beautiful thing about nil, this uh, somewhat different incarnation of the notion of zero or null, is that in Objective-C, it's perfectly legitimate to send messages to nil, whereas C, C++, bad things happen. It crashes if you dereference null. The nice feature, for better or for worse, about nil is that it will just ignore messages that are sent to it. Now, this is a good thing in that with one line of code, I can release the memory even if no memory has been allocated. It's just going to ignore it. The downside is, arguably, you're now kind of getting a little lazy potentially, and you might mask what otherwise might be bugs. Maybe I'm calling release because I've been dumb, and I add, got my arithmetic wrong, and I'm releasing 10 times, but I only allocated once. So that's nine mistakes that would essentially be uh, pushed under the rug here. But in general, it's a nice thing because the alternative would be to write, much like you would in many languages, Something like, if name is not equal to nil, then go ahead and do that. It just cleans up the code, which is one of the selling points of using nil in this way. Yes, uh, question top right. Yeah. Good question. Do you have to put a declaration of dalloc in your .h file? Short you can. Short answer, no, you don't have to, because it's already an ns object .h. So it's already been declared as part of the class hierarchy for you. So um, might as well not bother cluttering up your .h file, but uh, it would not break things if you did. Yeah? If you have an init function that does not, does not set name at that time, is it assumed that name Good question. Um, it would be def by default nil or zero or 0.0, .0 depending on the underlying data type. Okay. You can count on it. Yes. Yeah. There are known defaults for uh, instance variables. And one other question here. Yeah. Uh, uh, like a correct. Exactly. You only need to retain an alloc and release objects, so capital letter classes, primitives like lowercase int, long, double float, you don't have to do anything with them um, because they are just raw sequences of bits that just get copied um, and don't need memory allocation dynamically. Good question. All right, so can we do better? Because frankly, even though this is a silly example, if those of you with Java backgrounds have probably written classes with half a dozen, a dozen different instance variables or getters and setters, you end up just copying and pasting a lot of code again and again and again. And now, frankly, it feels like it's going to quickly get bug prone if I have to actually think about implementing my getters and setters with regard to memory management, which again in Java is handled for you. So can't the compiler help me here? Well, indeed it can. So this is student's three uh, project. And I'm going to go ahead and open up student.h now and notice some new syntax. And frankly, this is one of the 
things that starts to hurt the brain quickly. But once you know what the options are, I think it very quickly becomes more readable. So, some new pieces of syntax. This is a new version of student.h. This is in our third version of students, so students3. The class declaration is identical up top with regard to instance variables. I've got an age and a name. But now notice this at the bottom is identical. I've got my setters and getters declared exactly as before. But I've done some funky things here. I now have introduced this new keyword, at property, with this comma separated list of、uh, parameters, if you will, or settings assign non atomic read write, copy non atomic read write, then int age and ns string star name. There's going to be motivation for this in a moment. And I can clean up this code further, but let's spoil it first by looking at main.m. How can I use what I've just done? Well, it turns out. That now that I've declared properties, I get a new feature in Objective C 2.0. I no longer have to explicitly call a, function, a method called setAge or age or name or setName. Now I can use dot notation. And the compiler will infer for me whether or not to call the getter or the setter, depending on whether there's an equal sign there, implying assignment and therefore a need for the setter. So I allocate、uh, Alice just as before. As an aside, notice I'm not yet even using an init method for Alice. Init methods are not strictly necessary. Alloc is necessary if you want the memory. You don't need to call init. In fact, it's just a convention that it's even called init or something similar. I'm manually initializing my、uh, instance variables here, but we'll improve upon that shortly too. So Alice.age gets 20. Alice.name gets at Alice. So now I've gone from version one with my arrow notation, which was very low level. I was directly accessing the instance variables. I took that up one layer of abstraction and introduced getters and setters. But it was a little messy in that I had to pass the age message with the square brackets, the set age message with the square brackets. Just felt a little messy. Now, I apparently can replace version 2 with version 3 and just use dot. And because there's an assignment operator on this line of code, it's going to sort of auto magically invoke a method that by convention is called setAge. On the next line of code, it's going to by convention invoke a method called setName. So I deliberately named my messages earlier. Or my、uh, selectors earlier to be set capital age, set capital name, because it turns out. This is going to be useful in just a moment when I eliminate even more of my code. Let me wave my hand at the rest of this because Bob is copy pasted from Alice.、Uh, greet is the same, release is the same. But for now, any questions on this introduction of the dot syntax? Yeah. Excellent question. So let me go back to the header file and restate the question here. In my header file, notice that I said at property, then this parenthetical, then int age. Because I've said age, A G E there, and because I've said name here, these will be the names of my properties. Now I can change that. They can be completely unrelated to my instance variables, but as a matter of sanity, it's good to name them almost or exactly the same. But the names that you can use after a dot derive from these two lines here. Not from these two lines here. In just a moment, I'm going to clean this up and I'm even going to get rid of those because they're just a waste of my time and a potential distraction. So now let's see how we can use this. Well, if I now look at student.m, which is where I'm going to implement this class, notice that the implementation is the same. So this is copied and pasted from my previous code because my implementation of students hasn't changed. All I've added is some syntactic sugar, as it's called, by using at property, at property twice, so that now I have the capacity to use dot notation in my m file. So, those two lines change in the dot h, my, dot m,、uh, my main dot m file. I now use those dot properties, but now let's really leverage this feature、uh, for why it was added. So, I'm going to open up version 4 of students, and here we're going to see the following in my h file. Wow, I'm really chipping away at this. What do you no longer see in my dot h file for student dot h? There's no instance variables. <coughs> There's no getters, there's no setters, right? This almost feels like a step backwards, but notice that I did retain these two lines at property, at property. So, what's nice about the latest incarnation of Objective C and the、uh, related compilers is that now I'm declaring age and name, which means I can use this dot notation. But you know what's really cool is if now I go to student.m with these magical two lines, I can automatically have synthesized for me.
a method called age and a message called set age for free. Compiler will pay, copy, pay, generate, and paste in that code for me. I can automatically generate a method called set name and name, and the compiler will generate that code for me. All I have to do is tell the compiler or ask the compiler, please do this for me. You do that by way of the at synthesize keyword, which means go take a look at the properties I declared and please synthesize the following property. Now, the equal sign and underscore age here is actually not strictly necessary, but it's the latest sort of convention recommended in um, all the uh, in, uh, in the latest version of Xcode. This is saying call my property age, call my property name, but in addition to dynamically creating these methods called age and set age, name and set name, also go ahead and generate for me two instance variables, one called underscore age, one called underscore name and map the properties to those instance variables accordingly. So in the previous version, I did that exactly the same way but manually by writing a, a dozen or two lines of code because I used underscores in my own code. Now I'm just saying forget it. I'm tired of writing all this damn copy paste boilerplate code all these years. Now I want the compiler to help me a little bit with this programming uh, methodology with getters and setters and these two magical lines do exactly that. Generates the instance variables with these names. If I left them out, the instance variables would be called these literally, which might be fine if you're okay with the convention and I just had to specify in the .h file the two property lines. Yeah. In the compiler, not in the preprocessor. This is a feature of the, the front end compiler. And, and also, just to be clear, Xcode will recognize these methods as existing. So in a moment or in the projects, when you're actually writing code, you'll see that you can type set age and it will start to autocomplete, even though you yourself never even mentioned that method's name. Yeah. Exactly. So we're going to see this in a moment, too. Uh, very perfect segues here tonight. So we can see that, you know, what if I want three out of the four methods dynamically generated for me? Because I want to override the setter method for one of these things. You can just implement that setter method yourself and it will take priority over any automatically generated code. And so we'll see that, I think, in the next example. Yeah. So if name is a, an NS string, do we know that it does all the things that your handwritten setter showed? It does. It is. What the code I wrote in the previous example to implement set age and set name is identical functionally to the code that Synthesize will generate for me because of the attributes I consciously applied to the property. So we waved our hand a moment ago at these parentheticals. What's really going on here? Well, let's look at the more interesting one first, the NS string name. Recall we had this discussion just a few minutes ago about needing to retain it or make a copy of that name. Well, it's not sufficient then to just say to the compiler, go ahead and implement this setter for me. I have to tell the compiler, how do you want me to implement this setter? Do you want to retain the objects you're past? Do you want to copy them? Do you want to just assign them blindly as in the incorrect first version? Well, I'm specifically stating parenthetically, and the order of these things doesn't matter, copy which means make sure to add that line of code that I manually added a few moments ago that had the copy line so that I'm preserving, I'm uh, asking for my own copy of that string and taking on a reference count of one. Non-atomic for our purposes um, is almost always fine to use. It specifies that you're not using multiple threads. You won't potentially run into race conditions. So there's a slight performance benefit of saying I don't need uh, atomicity around this instance variable. It's fine to just leave that special code out as I did manually, read, write, just means give me a getter and a setter. If I said read only, it would give me just a getter. So these are really the three possible options that would apply to something like an NS string. And notice I used copy because it's a string. And I worried about this corner case of mutable strings and things changing on me. So for now, good rule of thumb, if it's an NS string, use the copy semantics. Now as for this int called age, I can actually be a little lazier here because it's just a primitive. It's 32 bits. And so I don't need to jump through hoops about retaining and releasing because there's no objects involved. So I'm just going to say create me a setter that just does assignment. Very simple one-liner like I myself wrote non-atomic because I don't care about uh, uh, multi-threading, read-write because I want a getter and a setter. So through those three hints separated by commas, I'm telling the compiler how to implement the set age and set name methods and they would be re-implemented differently if I changed uh, any of those uh, attributes. Yeah. 
Good question. So we'll, this will get a little easier, I think, when we have some more concrete examples. But really, the motivation here for the string using copy is that there are some classes that come with the various Apple frameworks, um, like string, where there's a subclass like, that's itself mutable. And the problem specifically I'm trying to avoid here is if Alice is handed a string that's by nature mutable. It means it can be changed by someone. And I simply retain that. Because it's mutable, it means someone outside of the context of Alice's own setter could change the spelling of her name just because, and Alice wouldn't realize it. The name would just be changed on her. So with this copy, I'm making sure I get my own version of A-L-I-C-E that no one else can ever change. And the only reason I'm worried about that is, again, because of this mutable subclass. So it might not apply in all cases, but certainly with strings, it's, it's the common case. Uh, with things like arrays and sets, uh, dictionaries, as we'll see, you could use copy semantics. But generally, if you're passing large data structures around, you probably want to share the instance and not create big copies of these things. So retain would suffice there. So let's, oh, yep, question. You, you can. So I'm trying to be pedantic here um, for tonight, but assign is the default. So I could have left this out for the int, but here I want to specify copy explicitly. Atomic is, for better or for worse, the default. Probably he uh, hedges uh, accidental bugs in multi-threading environments, so you have to override that one explicitly. Read-write is the default. So you'll see an example, too. I started to get bored with retyping this all the time, so I just leave out read-write and only write read-only if I don't want a setter. Good question. All right, so let's take this one step further. S students 5, what can I do here? So in students 5, notice my .h file is now identical. So we're making some progress. We're sort of happy now with that implementation. So what might have changed here? Well, let's look at student m, or actually, let's look at main m. So notice in main.m, I just have a silly play application that's pretty much copied and pasted from before, but this time I decided to add David to the student list. So I've got Alice, I'm using my new favorite dot notation, Bob, and David, and notice that David's age 33, name at David, I'm greeting David, releasing David, let's see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and run this code, notice, uh, or take my word for it, that I've synthesized these properties, so I didn't bother implementing my getters and setters as is uh, kind of implied by the fact that I had no declarations of them in the header file. So I'm leveraging at property and at synthesize. Let's run this program. My little command line will pop up. And notice what happens down here. If we enlarge the text. Interesting. Feels like a special case, hopefully. <laughs> Right? So it said David a moment ago, but now for those in back it says hello dummy. So how is this happening? Well, it was a perfect segue, your question before, about manually overriding methods if you don't actually want all of them implemented for you. If I now look at what's actually going on in student uh, dot m, notice that I did synthesize age and name, but I also said, you know what, I'm going to manually implement set name, so I'm going to go ahead and implement it as follows. Now the specifics here. Uh, well, let's work through the syntax. The, the functionality here is just silly. But the goal was I wanted to make sure that anyone named David had his name changed, but everyone else passed it through unaltered. So I'm using my syntax from before. Make sure that my instance variable does not equal name. And notice here what's cool about synthesize is that I know that underscore name exists, even though I didn't declare it in my h file, because I did declare a property and then synthesized it with an ivar called underscore name backing it when I used at synthesize in my .m file just a moment ago. So I'm first making sure I'm not accidentally uh, being given the exact same object. I'm releasing whatever object I currently have, if any. Might be nil, but that's fine. And now I'm saying if name, which is an object I was handed as a parameter, is equal to string. So just like in Java, you can't just compare references if they're strings. You need to do like string.equals. If it's equal to the string at David, well, then I want to do the following. I want to assign to the name Ivar, instance variable, an NS string, uh, an allocated NS string. So I'm dynamically allocating memory. And I want to initialize it with, I want to initialize it with at dummy. And therein lies the little trick. Now, otherwise, if you don't actually equal David, I'm just going to make a copy of your name. So this is identical to the line of code earlier. Now, as an aside, this is, slight, this is probably the new syntax, the fact that I'm allocating a string, then calling this init with method. But I needed to make sure I was getting my retain and my releases right. I didn't want to take a shortcut and just say, oh, you know what? Well, let's go ahead and say at, uh, at 
at David here because now I'm not explicitly calling alloc, which means I better not in my dalloc be calling release if I myself did not alloc that string. And so again, just to be consistent here, and we'll spend more time in future examples on memory management, just notice the similarity. I'm making sure that in this case I'm calling copy, in this case I'm calling alloc, but that is okay because again, the rule of thumb at this point in the story tonight is that anytime you call alloc or copy, you call, sorry, anytime you call alloc, copy, or retain, you must call release. So I don't have to use the exact same methods, but at least one of those. Yeah? Unfortunately, I don't get that for free. With the synthesis, I have to implement dialloc myself, which kind of makes sense because I could be doing a lot more juicy stuff in the student class that I really need that, uh, that control over, the release thereof. So I do have to know what IVAR name I chose in the, uh, the synthesis process. And so I have to release name and then whatever my parent class is, tell him to do his thing as well. But I don't have to do that for underscore age because, again, age is not an object. It's just a primitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, good question. No, I don't think so, but we can test this. So the question is if I change the order of some of these declarations. Okay, so yes, it does matter much like it would in a C or C++ compiler. So yes, order matters. Um, so the style of putting them at the top is actually good practice anyway. Those will go away once it actually finishes saving properly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Put which in the header file? Synthesis should go in the .m file, in the actual implementation, particularly so that you don't get um, those synthesis lines included if someone else is using your header files. So almost always definitions, code that you write, and implicit here is code that's being generated for you, goes in the .m file. Only declarations, like your class definitions, method declarations, global variables, should go in the header file. It would be like writing your methods in the .h file, where so just as a design decision, it doesn't belong. Yeah? Um, what's, what's the meaning of the um, if underscore name is not equal to So this is just to be sure that in weird corner case, if Alice is passed her name again and it's an identical object, what we don't want to do is release that name because now it's my current name because now it just means I decremented my reference count to zero and yet I'm presumptuously still hanging on to that. So I need to make sure to avoid that. Now I could avoid the if condition and just retain it first, then maybe uh, um, goofily release it. But this way I'm just not bothering uh, touching the reference count at all. Good question. All right, so a couple last enhancements here. Let me open up version 6. I was really on a roll at this point, as you can tell. So what are we doing here is initialization. So I'm getting a little tired of manually initializing things with my properties, with my arrows, with my explicit calls to these uh, setters. So let's actually start following some best conventions here by having init methods. The convention, uh, the name init, I-N-I-T, just a convention. You could call it foo or bar. Don't, but here we're going to go ahead and declare init with name, and it's going to take a name parameter, and age, and it's going to take an age parameter. And we saw a preview of this in the keynote slide a moment ago. So this is now just going to be a method that I can call after calling alloc, so I can just kind of re uh, prepare this object all at once. So let's take a look at the implementation of this in the, uh, the .m file. Notice I have two. I didn't bother declaring the init method because I get that for free in the NS object class, but that doesn't mean I can't implement my own. In fact, I decided just so that I don't get some weird, funky object that has no name, no age associated with it, I decided that in my default init method, my implicit constructor, if you will, I want to, one, call my parent class's init method, which doesn't always have a material effect, but absolutely should you get in the habit of doing in case you start subclassing other classes. And this is just a sanity check. If I allocate a student object but don't manually set his name or property, he's going to be named John of John Harvard fame, and he's currently, I did the math, 403 years old. So that's going to be my default student object, just because, didn't need it strictly. But here is my more explicitly named uh, initializer, init with name and age. I again do this uh, pattern of checking that I actually get back an object from my superclasses init method. Now I'm going to go ahead and use those properties 
uh, that I myself chose to synthesize for me, then I return self. And recall from last week that self is quite like this, self-referentially. So you do want to return that. And notice, too, the curiosity here that these init methods return IDs. Uh, as a matter of convention, you could more explicitly say they return student stars. But generally, init methods would return ID, which is pretty similar to void star. Uh, but it just means this returns a pointer to an object of some sort. So ID is the convention there for any of these init methods. Any questions? All right, so that was a lot. Why don't we go ahead and take a three minute break and we'll return with a few more features and fun. All right, so we are back. So just a couple of more pre uh, teasers of syntax and then we will dive headfirst into actual iOS and some iPhone simulations um, and start using this stuff to develop the mobile applications you've been promised. So in this seventh example, student seven, I just wanted to introduce some features that we're going to soon start taking for granted. At this point in the story, we've pretty much covered most, if not all, of the new syntax or most uh, scary looking syntax. Now we're just going to to start using some useful features of the language, some of the collection classes that come with Apple's various uh, frameworks. So this example here in main.m of student7 is taking for granted the fact that student.h student and student.m exists. I don't want to bother changing those now. But notice that I'm introducing the notion of a collection class here, namely NS mutable array. As the name implies, this is an array whose contents can change. This is in contrast to an NS array, which you have to pre-populate when you initialize it, otherwise they're after you cannot change it. So the mutable class is going to allow me to just add objects over time. I'm not going to add much for this demo, but here's how we allocate it. I want a pointer to an NS mutable array, call it students, and here's one way that I can allocate this thing. So I could use alloc and I could use um, init. And I started that sentence wrong, and so I did in this example. So I <laughs> thought I did it a different way. So NS mutable array, I'm allocating it, and I'm initializing it. And the init method is just doing whatever initial setup that it needs to in order to hand me back an empty array. Yeah? Uh, they should have always returned self at the as the very last line. Uh, the setters. Init should have been declared as ID. You can double check, but it, wouldn't have, it shouldn't have compiled if I got the return type wrong. But uh, do point it out if it's in the printouts that way. So I'm allocating and initializing just an empty mutable array, and a vector, if you will, that I can add stuff to. And here's how I can go about adding Alice to it. So I have, um, for here, taken a um, shortcut. So I'm actually not bothering with my student class just yet. I'm going to take a shortcut and just do name, because I want to focus on the collection, not on the objects. And I'm going to, whoop, oh, sorry. Let's scratch that. I'm remembering my wrong example again. So with students, which is the name of my mutable array, I'm calling the add object method, or passing the add object message to this object. And I'm on the fly allocating a new student object, initializing it with the name of Alice and an age of 20. I'm then doing the exact same thing here with Bob. And then just to demonstrate that this does, in fact, work, I'm going to use what's called fast enumeration, which is just a syntactic feature of Objective-C 2.0, where much like uh, Java these days, I can do this one-liner for uh, variable in uh, collection, I can now iterate over every student in the collection, calling each one iteratively s. I could have specifically said student star here, but I actually didn't need to in this case. So I just said id, which would allow me to put any type of object in this array, much like you can do in Java. But here it has uh, no material effect. I pass the student, whether Alice or Bob, to the greet function, which is identical to before. And then I release the object, which I must do because I allocked it up here. So if I go ahead and run this, we're going to be underwhelmed with the end results because it's just a re-implementation of the program we've been writing. But indeed, I'm informed at the bottom, hello, Alice, I see that you are 20 years old. Hello, uh, Bob, I see that you are 21 years old. A uh, question was in back. Yes? Good question. Um, can you override, say, alloc to get? Um, the right approach. Good question. So that's the, by convention what you should be using the init method for. Almost always do you see alloc followed by a call to init um, or init with foo, init with bar or whatnot. 
Correct. Or there's also a new operator, which has the effect of calling alloc and init in succession and returning the result of the latter. So, so long as you've overridden NS objects in default implementation of init, that would be your more elegant one liner there. Yeah. So that's correct. So an ID is similar in spirit to Java's object reference, um, sort of this grandfather class, whereby it's OK if I'm passing a non-specific object into a more specific a function declaration so long as I'm then using that pointer in the right way. So I mentioned earlier that I could have changed my for loop to actually iterate more explicitly with a pointer called s that's of type student uh, star. Um, but I chose not to just because of the added syntax and because here it had no material effect, the more generic uh, ID, which again, for those familiar with C, is similar, very similar to void star, is adequate to get the job done. All right, so let's do one more neat feature here. So if I actually want an immutable array, and again, now we're really not focusing so much on students, but just on these collection classes, these things we're going to just want in our toolkit as we start to make iOS apps. Well, here is my main method now. I've really chopped this thing down significantly here. In this example, I notice I don't have any student class, no student.h, no student.m, because I just wanted a quick and dirty example now only involving strings. Now I have an um, immutable array as implied by the lack of any mention of mutable. So NS array is immutable. Can't change it once you allocate it and initialize it. What's the syntax for this? I have an NS array, and it has a convenience method, a class method, so one of those plus methods, called array with objects. And it takes as its arguments a comma-separated list of objects you want to pass in. And the at sign denotes, here's a string, here's a string. So at Alice, comma, at Bob, comma, nil. It must end with nil. Uh, much like in C, you need at the end of a string a sentinel value of uh, backslash 0. This is creating an array that henceforth I cannot change, but it's going to be of size 2 with quote unquote Alice and quote unquote Bob in it. So now, just as before, I can iterate over these students. And here I'm just iterating over the names, calling each one iteratively name and just calling nslog. I even threw out my greet method because I was getting tired of all the copy paste. But the point here is how you can pass, we've not seen this yet tonight, is how you can pass a message containing a comma separated list of values for one of the parameters. Yeah. No, you can, uh, does the array have to have the same type of objects? No, you can mix it. Um, in this case, it makes sense that I'm using strings only because I'm assuming they're strings later. Um, but no, you do not, you, uh, you may mix data types in an array if programmatically that makes sense. Yeah? Oh, good question. Can you add the age? You could not add in the int known as age. You would have to wrap it with an Objective-C class, much like the integer class, capital I, or the float class, capital F, in Java, so that you are indeed adding to the array objects only. But here, too, it would really, be a little weird if I now added an age, a, a name, and then an age, and a name, and an age. At that point, I really should start bundling them together again in a, an object, like a student class. But again, here I just wanted something quicker and dirtier, so I just threw away the student code altogether. But you could absolutely get back to that version of a student class. So almost done with students here. Um, so here we have an approach where I am using a mutable array. Um, but let me. I'm back to the approach of allocating objects. There we go. So I'm back to the approach of using students. And notice this one difference now. I decided I was getting a little tired of calling init all over the place. Because any time I call init, it's usually because I've called alloc, which means I then later need to call release. So I want to finally now start leveraging, for better or for worse, the so-called auto-release pool. This bucket of memory that so long as I create my objects in the right way, they get added to this special auto-release pool of memory that effectively gets freed for me later without me having to remember to call release. So the way I can go about doing this might be this way here. So I've got a class method, as denoted by the plus, in my student.h file. It's going to be called student with name and age. Now notice the very intentional symmetry here. Just as I called init 
in it with name and age. The convention, and you'll see this in the foundation classes that Apple provides, is if you want to have a convenience class that does the memory management for you, thanks to some auto release trickery, you, want, you should be in the habit of naming it identically to the class. Followed by the same kind of parameterization. And you, we actually um, will see this in the context of arrays as well. Notice my properties are declared as before. So let me go ahead and take a look at student.m. And this is our one new fancy feature in this class. So in student.m, I have to now implement this class method. I have the plus as before. It returns an ID because, again, init method should return self, which is going to be typed generally as ID. And now what am I doing in here? Well, I already have my init method, so I can still leverage that OK. But recall that if I call alloc, I better call release unless I instead choose to call auto release. So I did it on one line here, but you could certainly break this out with some local variables. Allocate a student. Initialize it with the name that was passed into this method and the age that was passed into this method, but then call auto release on it. And this is wrapping just because the font is so big. But instead of calling release, I'm calling auto release, both of which return self, which means I can do this all in one line and effectively still return myself. Auto release tells the, uh, tells the operating system. When you get around to draining that pool we talked about earlier, use that as the opportunity to decrement this object's reference count by one, at which point my uh, uh, choice to call alloc will be reversed, because that was plus one. When it's auto release, when the pool is drained, that's minus one. So if that point in the story, no one else has retained this thing, then it will go to zero, and this object will be flushed down the drain with the rest of the so-called auto release pool. So the advantage here is what? Well, this is actually representative of a very common paradigm in the foundation classes whereby sometimes it's really useful to call a method that clearly has to allocate memory for like an array or set, some interesting data structure, maybe even a student. But if that method has to allocate memory, there's no way that method can then release that memory. Because if the point of getting that student object or that array or whatever is to ask a method for a chunk of memory, well, once he returns that chunk of memory, his opportunity to run and execute lines of code is done. So that begs the question, how do you release, how does he release memory in the future? Well, he flags that object with auto release, which means because I'm about to relinquish control of this object and it won't have a chance after that curly brace to ever release it again, I better auto release it now. So that its reference count is still one, but when the so-called pool of memory gets drained, then it will go down to zero. And I ensure that just because I allocated memory, I'm not going to create a result in this guy's program being uh, uh, leaky. In terms of memory, uh, yeah. So, but the one that's returned is not. So you're talking about just the chunk of memory that was used within this, in, uh, within this uh, right here between these curly braces, right? That's like, what about what's returned? That's still kept. Is that given off to something else? Oh, uh, so rem okay. Good question. So. That, what we're, when we auto release, we're referring to the object that's re allocated here. Recall that alloc returns a pointer. A pointer is just the address of some chunk of memory. This, this method itself is returning the ID, you know, it's returning its student. Self, yes. So auto release, to be clear, sets this. OK, so alloc allocates memory for an object. In it, puts some vari values in there, like uh, Alice and 20, or whatever the parameters were. Auto release. Uh, ensures that even though alloc set the reference count to 1 at this point, auto release says eventually apply minus 1, but later, only when the so called pool is drained. Now, when is later? Well, at least in this example, recall main.m. The very first thing we've done in every program tonight is create this pool, but more importantly, the very last thing we do in every program tonight drains the pool. And so that is to say, the pool is not going to get drained until literally the last possible moment in this program's execution. So that little mental note to decrement reference count by one, thanks to auto release, will only actually get applied at the very last moment in time. So it's going to keep the memory around longer. And so one, just to point it out, if you're starting to think this way, the downside, arguably, of using auto release in this way is you can start to pile up a lot of stuff in memory because you figure, eh, it'll get deallocated eventually. So the reality is if you start to write code that, for instance, is in a loop, like a for loop or a while loop, which has to alloc a lot of memory, you actually want to generally declare a more local pool. You can have multiple auto release pools that you create and then drain inside of the scope of that loop so that at least you're not piling 
piling and piling objects up on memory and then waiting literally until the user quits the iPhone app or the Mac application to actually free it up. But for small allocations like we've been doing, perfectly fine to just let it linger. Yeah, a couple more questions, then we should forge ahead. Yeah. Just the, uh, it's applying only to the student object. Um, but notice I have not called retain on the name here. That's being done in my setter. But the dealloc method for the student class does have its own dealloc. I'm sorry, the dealloc method in the student class is what releases the name. So we already took care of that before. Exactly. So when this, um, correct, so when the student object is released, when the pool is drained, by definition of release, if the reference count goes to zero at that point, the student class's dealloc method will get called. But we wrote that and we took care or we used the synthesis uh, feature to make sure that we uh, release this. And it, that feature exists even on our synthesized property because of our retain, at our copy attributes, which is an, impl uh, which is, uh, was our hint that we better free that memory, release that memory in our dialloc method. OK, one more question. Yeah. Is it correct that you only have one pool per call frame? Oh, good question. One pool per call frame? Uh, yeah, you would drain the pool before you opened another one. So you could have multiple uh, the creations and then drainings of pools, but they would be in different chunks of the code. You wouldn't nest them. Yeah. They probably could be nested, but uh, it probably could be nested. But you're starting. Hmm? Well, I mean, say I write some code where I think I'm going through a loop and, I'm, and, and I need an auto release pool because I'm doing a lot of stuff. So that's and fine. Then, and then I'm calling a library function. <laughs> and the person who wrote the library function says, this function goes through a lot of loops, so it should have an auto release. So that's absolutely true, and we're already seeing that because main, we, they're by nature nested across methods. I'm saying if you're writing one method that itself, that's probably getting into some potentially poor design choices. In the system wide, yes. You might not even know it. Yes, in different stack frames, as is implied by the fact that we're doing this in main, and then we could do it in methods that are called thereafter. So, so what, does the pool become cognizant of something when, it, when auto release is executed, or is it, does it know about all outs? Uh, I think what you just said is immaterial in that um, when the pool is drained, release is effectively called once for each of the objects that's been added to the auto release pool. So it doesn't know about how many times you called retain or copy. Um, it needs to, uh, yeah. So in short, so, not a problem. So the pool, in essence, is not necessarily a physical pool of memory. It is a list of things on which auto release has been called. Exactly. It's, you can think of it as a linked list of memory that needs to get uh, its reference count decremented. All right. Um, I think it's time for some iPhone. All right. So I'm going to just wave my hands at some things we'll return to over time. But just so that you uh, have heard these terms before as you start to encounter them in the documentation in the meantime, know that there are a few other features of Objective-C that we won't actually play with hands-on tonight. But one of them is called categories. You can actually add methods to an existing class, even a class like the NS string class or the NS array class, by defining your own category, which in this case I decided to call bar, and then specifying in a .h file just what methods you want to add to this. You can do this in JavaScript, if familiar, through the prototype property. Um, and in, uh, but this is a way of doing it without actually subclassing things, as a language like Java would actually do. We can, can start to get a little messy or unwieldy. So in short, when you see interface and then a class name, uh, an existing class name, followed by a parenthetical, the parenthetical is the name of the category. And that means here come some more methods that are inside of this category. So, but again, a wave of the hand, we'll see that before long. There are things called protocols in uh, Objective-C, which are analogous to Java's interfaces. So if you want to commit to the world that your uh, class that you're writing will implement at least these four methods, 
Well, you can specify that my uh, class, say student, adheres to the NS copying protocol. And this protocol says you better implement a method called copy with zone. But again, we'll see this before long. And that's, again, much like Java's interface, which says I'm at least going to give you these methods. Um, here's an example of this. But again, we'll come back to this before, time, so before long. So let me wave my hand at the specific implementation. But let me point out two other features you'll encounter, though not terribly commonly um, in the foundation classes. So Objective-C does support exceptions. Relatively expensive to handle, whereas Java kind of uses them to an extreme sometimes um, to handle an, any number of error conditions, not just corner cases, file not found, URL not found, or the like. Um, it tends not to be the paradigm so much in Objective-C, but the syntax does exist, and you will see them with some classes. The syntax is at try, try something there, at catch, specify what you want to catch, a point or two, and at finally, much like Java. So again, a wave of the hand at this feature, but know that it does exist, that we won't encounter it terribly often. What you you will see perhaps a little more commonly is this use of NS error. Um, understanding this kind of uh, assumes some familiarity with last week's lecture where we talked about the basics of C and uh, the ampersand operator, the star operator. But for now, know that if I'm going to call a pass a message to an object and that object kind of needs a back channel toward giving me an error message that's not just a return value. I don't want it to return negative 1 or something arbitrary as a return value. I want it to be able to return an object without throwing that object, which is relatively expensive. You can pass in a pointer to a pointer. And what you will get by way of that level of indirection is back a pointer to an NS error object inside of which is an error code, a name, an English description, and the like. So you will see this in some of the documentation, but we'll point it out if we encounter it here. In this case here, foo is the object. Bar is the message I'm passing with a baz parameter, a second parameter called uh, error, and ampersand e means pass in a pointer to this pointer so that what the method can do for me is repoint that pointer at an actual NS object that it essentially creates for me. But again, we'll come into this in context, but for now, know that NS error and NS exception might indeed exist. As for collections, we've seen two of the most common, NS array and mutable array. We'll play before long with dictionaries, which is like a hash table and mutable dictionaries, uh, a set, which is an unordered uh, collection of items, as well as NS mutable set. We looked at fast enumeration, looked at memory management. We'll play before long with GDB. But now we get to the beginning of our iPhone stuff. So whew, that was Objective C. Now we can start using it. Um, but please ask many, many questions on help.c76 as you need them, especially as you read through the, uh, the online references we've pointed you at and even the examples from tonight. So you're familiar with this paradigm by now, this notion of model view controller. And it's really ingrained into the iOS and the Mac OS frameworks. Um, we're going to start simple tonight. And next week, what we're going to do is introduce some of the MVC code that comes with Apple's various uh, framework, including uh, NS View Controller. We'll look at uh, tab bar applications, all of the familiar uh, GUI widgets that you might have seen on your or friend's iPhone or iPad. We'll start to explore some of those built-in features. But for tonight, we're going to start to roll some of our own code, but still adhering to this pattern of uh, model, view, and controller. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and open up a new file. And now finally, we're going to go up top here under iOS. And I'm going to choose, wow, from any number of templates. And at first, this is kind of overwhelming. But the reality is the simplest one up here is this thing, window-based application, simplest in that it gives us the least code of all. Still gives us some code for free, some pre-wired stuff, which we'll explore in a moment. But it gives us a lot less distraction. Next week, we'll start to look at one or more of these other templates. Not that we couldn't write it from scratch. In fact, we will at some point. But it just helps to get things started. But for now, focus on window-based application, sort of the GUI analog of our command line application for Mac OS because it'll be relatively simple. The first thing I'm asked is for my product name. I'm going to call this nib1. So a nib, as we'll soon see, is a file that's formerly associated with a program called Interface Builder, which is this drag and drop interface for making iPhone and iPad UIs. That Interface Builder product, as I mentioned last week, is now integrated into Xcode 4. But you'll see it mentioned IB Interface Builder all uh, throughout online references and books. Uh, nib file is the, it used to be a .nib file in which all of this stuff was stored. Uh, with Xcode's introduction a few years ago, it became XIB. Um, and it's actually an XML file that stores uh, the wiring 
that we're going to do visually in a moment. So this is just my first version. And I'll call it nib, just because that's how the world pronounces it. Company identifier. For now, this won't matter so much, but it will once we start installing applications on your own phone. It relates to the sign uh, digital signatures that must be applied to the code so you can actually run it. For now, it's a material, but I'm going to go ahead and just make it edu.harvard.nib1. I'm going to leave it as iPhone just so I have a small UI for tonight. And I'm going to skip any additionally generated code for simplicity. And I'm going to be asked where to save this. And if this is a little quick, rest assured that the first project, if you haven't looked at it yet, um, will walk you very slowly through all of these steps. So you don't need to write them all down. So what do I get here? Well, I saw last week that we see a bit of a GUI here and some orientation related stuff, but more on that before long. At top left, we get some of these pre generated files. So, what's here at top left? Well, let's see. I'm going to expand most of these groups. They look like folders, but those same folders don't necessarily exist on disk. And what do I have? Well, at the top, or in the middle here, main.m. So that makes me feel good. At least I'm at least in familiar territory. But there's some other stuff. There's a PCH file, still pretty familiar. That's the precompiled header, so at least we're on familiar ground. There's these plists or property list files. We're not going to use them just yet, but this is a way of storing with your product, with your program, key value pairs, uh, preferences, settings, these kinds of things. It's one way of setting that. And also stuff like this. What you'll find for better or for worse about Xcode as you proceed is that there's often many different ways to achieve the same thing, which frankly can be very confusing at first because you change something somewhere and yet, or you open an example online and it's sort of assuming something. So hopefully we'll help guide you through that uh, both tonight and in the first project. But for now, we're going to ignore those property lists and the dot strings file. The top three we will play with. Main window dot nib, so XIB, but pronounces nib these days. Um, that's a going to, it's really an XML file. But when I click it, I'm going to get a little drag and drop interface where I can start dragging and dropping all my familiar user widgets for the iPhone, like scrolling things and date things and text fields and all of that. The nib1 app delegate files, both the .h and .m, are the so called application delegate. And the control flow of this program is going to work as follows. So let's start from the beginning main.m, which you should rarely, if ever, actually have to touch. Looks like this. Thankfully, a little familiar. I got an auto release pool. I'm then draining it later or releasing it here. Um, slight distinction, but uh, uh, same effect here. And then what's happening in this? This is the line of code that makes all iPhone applications possible. So I'm calling UI application main and passing in these command line arguments, which generally are immaterial. But UI application main clearly, just intuitively, must be running my program. Because once it returns, auto release pool gets released, return, uh, the method re function returns, and main is done. So the magic seems to be happening here. This is like a really big loop that's just waiting and waiting and waiting for user input while my game or application or whatever is running. Well, by nature of some of the wiring that uh, Xcode gives you for free, this thing called a UI application has a delegate. A delegate is going to be an object whose purpose in life is to actually implement the program for it. So there's the application who's going to completely punt and say, if you want to implement an iPhone application, you deal with it. And so that's going to be our application delegate. Well, this is great because we already saw mention of this keyword delegate. That h and .m file are apparently the class in which you're going to implement an iPhone app. Now, a little bit of a white lie, because we can use other classes altogether. And in fact, there's going to be these multiple layers of indirection that at first are a little tricky to wrap one's mind around. But let's take a look in this file, nib one app delegate.h. OK, thank God. There's very little here. So hopefully, we can wrap our mind around this quite fast. I've got an import line. Now I'm importing not just the foundation stuff elsewhere, but UI kit, user interface kit. And that makes sense if I'm going to start making something with an actual user interface, not just command line. Notice at interface, nib one app delegate. Why this crazy name? Whatever, Xcode just decided that if you name your project nib1, the class it's going to pre create for you, thanks to those templates, even the simplest one, is going to be called product name app delegate, capitalized as follows. So that's always going to change. It inherits from NS object. We've seen that before. Oh, interesting. This is called a what? This is a protocol. So briefly mentioned this earlier, but that just means that this class that was pre-generated for us is apparently minimally going to implement some number of methods. And I bet instinctively those methods are the ones that make iPhone applications work. And sure enough, we'll see them in just a moment. There's this property, 
So notice here, and there's a new keyword, and we'll see this before long, but there's another property I'm getting predefined from in this template that says this application delegate is going to have a property called window. And you can now think of this as a connection between code and the glass screen on an iPad or an iPhone. It's a pointer to the actual rectangle in which interesting stuff can be drawn. So that's what this window pointer can do. This IB outlet stands for Interface Builder Outlet.、Uh, not strictly necessary, but what we'll see in a moment is that this means we can drag and drop some lines to kind of wire things together in Interface Builder because of that keyword's presence. But otherwise, the only thing new in this file thus far tonight is this keyword and this use now of an actual protocol. Everything else syntactically, we're perfect with now. All right, what about the .m file? Oh my God, so much stuff. But I like to see green, means comments, means there's actually not all that much here. So a lot of this we can kind of turn a blind eye to for now. At the top of the file, it's importing my .h file. This is familiar ground.、Uh, implementation nib1 app delegate. Okay, familiar in that that's just a stupid arbitrary name for my program that was pre generated by the template. Synthesize, I'm familiar with this. This just means, okay, whatever this window thing is, clearly I can use dot notation with it. So that's now familiar. Now, what's this crazy thing? So, application, now you can see where you can kind of take these,、uh, sounds like a sentence、uh, uh, mnemonic to an extreme.、Uh, application did finish launching with options, and it takes two parameters application and launch options.、Uh, silly though this name is, this is where the application really gets kick started. This is where if you want to do any kind of customization and really do something interesting and not just have a blank screen, Your code is going to start to go here, as ours will before long. Notice that this is just a comment self.window make key invisible. In a moment, I'll run this program without even writing a line of code, and we'll get essentially a blank window, but it will be visible. I'll at least see a white background, and that's because of this line of code. I'm passing to the window. Instance variable by way of this property, a message, make key and visible. Visible means show it to the human, so it's not all black, essentially. Key means listen for keyboard input in this window, and that's really all it takes to write an iPhone app, right? You got to show it to me and you got to let me type on the screen, and then stuff can happen. Return yes, it means just all went well, there's no crazy problems. And now, as for the rest of this stuff, I can actually delete everything else from this file. We'll come back to this before long. But notice this method here. Application will resign active. So, this is if you background an application these days. And you might want to do some housekeeping before it actually gets minimized and the user checks their email or whatnot. But I don't care about that now. In fact, all the stuff inside of it is commented out. Did enter background related to the same、uh, kind of workflow. Will enter foreground when the application is coming back. You can imagine if you've ever played a game and you get a phone call in the middle of it, the game hopefully will pause and not keep playing while you lose points or whatnot while you talk on the phone. So, again, this is where these methods are going to be useful. Not yet. But before long, did become active, will terminate. So now, okay, now I kind of am more comfortable with this. One method that apparently I'm going to have to deal with, long though its name is, and then a dialog. And all of this now is hopefully, even though it's a lot of new stuff all at once tonight, at least we're seeing similar patterns. I'm releasing the window that was declared as a property earlier, and I'm calling my superclasses dialog method. Yeah? Correct. So in this case, I can just delete these. They've already been declared in the superclass, so that's fine. Even though I'm specifying I adhere to this protocol, I just essentially have empty implementations of those methods. So it's perfectly fine to delete them there. And in fact, it makes me feel better that I can now understand everything. So I've just removed stuff that's otherwise clutter. So let me go ahead and compile this. I've got my iPhone simulator at the top. Notice if you do actually own an iPhone or an iPad, if you have it plugged into iTunes while writing code,、uh, quite often you'll accidentally install code onto your iPhone, which is maybe fine, but you'll wonder where did it go, and then it's there on your desk.、Um, so just realize that that menu up there at top left is where you can change between the simulator for iPhone, iPad, Or your actual iOS device. For the first project, you don't have to install an actual hardware, but we'll get there. Yeah? Oh, I haven't gotten there yet. But the, this is by default selected. And in a moment, when I click run, the simulator is going to launch for me automatically, and I'm going to see an iPhone, and there's my visible application that's ready for keyboard input. Just there's nothing much going on there. So let's make a really quick GUI here, a little graphical user interface. So, unfortunately, this small projector resolution, given our font sizes, won't quite do this justice, but I am going to have to open up a bit of window space here. So, I'm going to click mainwindow.nib, and that's going to make this thing appear. 
Uh, you can see kind of graph paper, which might help you align things. This feels like the dimensions of an iPhone, though a bit bigger on the screen. But I need to drag and drop some stuff. So you'll see in the project, you'll by default get these four squares, which frankly is completely useless if you're using the app for the first time and have no, no idea what those mean. So the PDF tells you to click this little triangle that's actually going to slap some names on those things. And they're a little small on the screen tonight, but you'll see mention of files owner, first responder, nib1 app delegate, and window. I don't really know what those are yet, but I do feel a little familiar with this. Window, we've seen. And now this, frankly, is a stupid convention. My class is called nib1 app delegate. Interface Builder, now Xcode, takes it upon itself to just put spaces in between capital letters, which is not really adding clarity, but realize that's where it's coming from. I didn't type that anywhere myself. So I'm going to go ahead and just minimize this again because it's kind of taking up a lot of space, but realize that the spec tells you to go there. But notice from last week, there's all these buttons at the top that the spec encourages you just to click on and see what breaks. Um, at the top right, though, there's the view. The icon that's selected means show me all the widgets on the left, but nowhere else. I'm going to click that view on the right, which is also going to give me a right-hand panel, which is going to be where I can start dragging and dropping some things. So I'm going to click this. And now this big panel here comes up. I'm going to make this a little taller. And this looks kind of fun. Right? I don't really know what I'm doing yet. But these kind of like, wow, I mean, I can just take one of these things from an app, a little uh, big switch. That would be fun to use in my app here. Let's put this over here. Oops. Put this over here. Yeah. So we're going to very quickly make some mistakes here. So let's just get rid of this stuff. But what do I care about? Well, there's a lot of stuff tonight, but I want a text field first. So I'm going to drag the thing called text field. And here, too, is where things get a little annoying sometimes. The WYSIWYG editor here calls it a text field, but it's actually a UI text field. So they don't actually show you the class name. So there's going to be little hiccups at first where you have to acclimate to the sort of dumbed down naming scheme versus the underlying classes. Because what we'll see next week is that even though we can drag and drop and write most of this application by wiring things together, as things get more sophisticated and as you realize, eh, I don't, Interface Builder is a little more trouble sometimes than it's worth, you can actually do these same applications almost entirely in code, at which point we'll kind of put, put these training wheels away. But for applications where there's a lot of widgets on the screen and it would kind of be annoying to figure out the various pixel locations where you want things, frankly, dragging and dropping is pretty compelling and then wiring things together. So let's do this. I have a text area here that I'm going to just drag and make a little wider. Notice here that uh, Xcode kind of draws these dashed lines, which encourages me to leave it there, just to leave a little buffer between that and the edge of the phone. I'm going to go ahead and grab a round rect button, which, whose name is UI button, which frankly is a little more clear. Um, but that's going to put a little button here. And I'm going to say something like go. And over here on my text area, notice at top right, there's all sorts of fun properties you can play with. And most of these are, many of these are self-explanatory. I'm going to care about placeholder for now. Uh, the goal of this application is going to be to ask the user for their name and then have them hit a button, at which point I'm going to generate a little pop-up window that's going to say, hello, David, or hello, dummy, or whoever it happens to be. So now I've got my interface. Very underwhelming, but I've got a text field at top. I've got a button down below it. But if I run this program now, I'll see those things, but they're not going to respond to anything. So I'm going to hit Command-R to build this application. You'll see it there at top left. So this is kind of cool. In fact, notice all the free functionality I get. If I click on the name field, notice I didn't even have to implement this neat little keyboard that pops up. And I can start typing D, A, V, I, D, or whatnot. Click Go. But unfortunately, nothing happens just yet. So we want something to start happening. So how can we actually do this? Well, I'm going to go sort of Julia Child style and open the complete version of this so we can actually see what code we would want to write. And then we'll start the process before long, in the weeks to come, really wiring everything together more manually. Here's my same interface, just to prove that I'm really not doing anything more interesting than I just did manually. But now notice uh, this. I'm going to cheat here for just a moment. Uh, let's go to my delegate. So in my N uh, nib1 app delegate file, notice that really there's not all that much going on except one new thing. There's something new here. Yeah, so I have this controller. So I wonder where this is coming from. So let me look at my .h file just to try to make sense of this. And this is in general when looking at online examples or from books. You can kind of start to reason through it by looking for new and interesting things. This looks mostly the same, but there's a new property 
called controller. So even though there's this UI application main function that completely punts the whole application and says, you deal with this to the application delegate, the application delegate, meanwhile, is apparently getting ready to create what I'm calling a controller. It's going to be a very generic class called controller. And I, it in turn is going to hand off control of my whole, if small, application to this controller class. Because I just want, by uh, my methodology here, to be MVC-like. I could put some of this stuff in the delegate, but it's a little cleaner if I just hand off control to my very own code and minimally touch this template code here. So what's going to be in my controller class? Well, I don't need to do all that much. So let's take a look at a sneak preview. My controller actually doesn't do all that much here. So here's my .h file for a controller. I've got a property called text field. So my controller, you can now think of as, again, the brains of this whole application. And as the brains, this guy, if his purpose in life is to ask me to type in my name and then redisplay that in a pop-up, well, he kind of needs to be able to programmatically talk to that text field that I dragged and dropped into the UI. So this property called text field, I could have called it foo, is just going to be a pointer, if you will, literally, to that text field. So there's at least unidirectional communication from code to drag and drop interface. But there's one new thing here. I do non-atomic. I do retain, borrowing the lessons from before. I'll read write as implicit, because I didn't mention it explicitly. But IB outlet is different. IB outlet is just a special keyword now that's not Objective C. It's just an interface builder clue that says, you know what? In that drag and drop interface, make sure that I can connect this property to a widget on the screen. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me go back to the nib file, the .xib file, and let me sort of undo something I did here and uncheck this. Here's what Interface Builder's workflow is generally like. At the top of this file, uh, at the top of this window, we have my controller object. And we'll see before long how I created that. But that represents my controller object. That's an icon representing my controller class code. I want to really conceptually and visually in a moment wire my controller to that text field so that the controller can look what the user typed and then pop it up in a window. I just need at least a channel of communication there. So what I'm going to do is hold control and drag from controller, literally, and notice the blue line that's appearing, to the text field, which now becomes highlighted. And when I let go, notice that it's going to show me these things called outlets. IB outlets, Interface Builder outlet. So what you now see from Interface Builder, from Xcode, is a list of all of the IB outlets I defined. So it's asking me, OK, you plugged in one end of this extension cord into your controller class. Where do you want to plug the, uh, you, uh, rather, you, you're running this extension cord from your controller class to this text field. Where do you want it plugged in in your controller? Well, the outlet that I gave a name to of text field. So as soon as I select text field, the blue line is going to go away. But now, behind the scenes, there is a, a virtual connection, a wire between my controller class and that name field. How do I access it? Well, I'm a programmer. I'm going to access it by way of that pointer called text field. And we'll see there's all sorts of methods and properties that I can use to manipulate this field. But the connection of code to GUI happened by way of that drag and drop. Now, I need to do it in the other direction, too. So let me go back to my controller class for a moment, my .h file, and notice these other new things. One new keyword tonight here. And this will really whet our appetite for the stuff to come. What's the new keyword? <laughs> OK, IB action. And you can kind of infer what this is about. IB clearly relates to Interface Builder, the UI. Action feels like a method. It's going to do something. So this is for an extension cord in the other direction. I clearly want the user to be able to click that button and for something to happen. Well, what do I want to happen? I want code to execute. So I need to really run an extension cord from the button to my controller class. Where do I plug that into? To this IB action. And my method, I arbitrarily called go. So in other words, if I want clicking that button to result in the go method being called, I need to run a wire in that other direction. So let me go to my nib file. Let me quickly remove the connection I already had. And what I'm going to do this time is go from right to left. Hold control drag from the Go button to my controller. I let go. Now notice this. I have two options, because I had two IB actions, one called Done, one called Go. I'm going to select Go. So now my controller object has a pointer called text field, which gives him, as we'll see before long, programmatic access to the actual GUI's text field. I've got another wire running from the Go button to the controller, which means anytime the user touches the Go button, my Go method gets called. So you know what? I can kind of see where this is going. If I look at my Go method in controller.m, 
Notice, sure enough, I'm mentioning text field here, and that makes sense. And I'm mentioning self.textField.txt. So this is a sneak preview as to the syntax we'll use to get the name from that actual text field. So let's actually see this thing all run in its succession. Well, if I click Run on the version that we have prefabbed and that you have in your printouts tonight, I've got, sure enough, this UI here. I'm going to go ahead and type in D-A-V-I-D and click Go. And voila, hello, David. So you actually get to do much less for your very first setup project. This is a teaser of stuff to come. Next week, we'll do this and more sophisticated UIs and then begin to build on the more complicated templates so that we can really make some of those apps with which you're probably already familiar. So section starts in a bit. We'll see you next week.